Hello, this webinar is titled God's Providences in American History, the Revolutionary War Extended Edition, and it's been recorded in front of a live audience. Well, let's go on a little journey. Go back with me to 1740, if you will, 26 years before the Declaration of Independence. America and the 13 colonies were in a little bit of a spiritual lull. The pilgrims came over in 1620. They felt commissioned of God to go forth and create a new community of people that would follow biblical truth. And we see that in the Mayflower, Mayflower Compact and the way they lived their lives in Plymouth Colony. But in that 120 years since, America and the colonies have gone through a little bit of a spiritual lull. In fact, 30 years up to 1740, it would be kind of called a little spiritually dead until God began to show up in the ministry of Jonathan Edwards. A New England pastor, he was known to read his sermons from a transcript in a monotone voice, and yet God began to speak to his congregation and people began to say, I want to know God in a personal way. It had to be God's activity. He didn't whip up the crowds like many televangelists today. He read in a monotone passion from his script, and yet God began to work dynamically. Meanwhile, over in Great Britain, a young 22-year-old evangelist began to get a heart for the colonies and began to come over here. His name was George Whitfield and preached revival from colony to colony, from city to city, from town to town. God's activity began and the Great Awakening began to prepare our country for the faith step they were about to take. And we've had Great Awakening since and then everyone that you look at, you see that God is preparing our country for something. And I believe that we're even in the beginning of an awakening now and God preparing our country for something. Interestingly enough, besides the spiritual impact this had, it had a political impact that was really not seen at the time, but it gave the colonies a sense of unity, and it began to shape within the colonies that before, where they had thought of themselves as distinct, now they began to think of themselves as interconnected. Was this providence, or was it an accident? Well, let's go on our time journey and see. In 1755, fast-forwarding several years, we're now in the French and Indian War. The French and the Indians are against the colonists and the British, who are still comrades at this point. There's a young 22-year-old general named George, or excuse me, a lieutenant named George Washington, traveling through West Virginia in the Monongahela National Forest area with a British brigade. He was with General Braddock and several other officers, and they walked into a French and Indian ambush. The French or the Indian chief in advance said, shoot everyone on a horse. Those are the leaders. If you can kill the leaders, they'll disperse and will emaciate this brigade. The Indians began to fire. They mortally wounded General Braddock. Several of the other officers were killed and the British were dispersed into the evening darkness and regathered in the woods where they gave a service for General Braddock. But George Washington came off unhurt. That night when he took off his coat, he found out there was four bullet holes through his coat. And during the course of that battle that day, two horses had been shot out from underneath him. He began to feel that somehow, miraculously, he'd been protected during that skirmish. And he wrote this in his a letter to his brother that very day. I have been protected beyond all human probability or experience. For I had four bullet holes through my coat, and two horses shot out from underneath me, yet escaped unhurt, although death was leveling my companions on every side of me. This appeared in American textbooks up until 1934. Several years after this excursion, um, the French and the Indians now were at peace with the colonies, and General Washington was now in that same era, and an old Indian chief came out to meet him, and he said, 15 years ago, I was in this valley on that particular day. I'm the one that told my Indian braves to shoot at you, and when we realized you were under divine protection, I told my braves to sh stop shooting. One of the braves that was also with that um, little 15-year-later uh, fellowship that day said, I personally had 17 fair shots at you, and my gun seemed to be working right, but for whatever reason, I kept missing. Providence or accident? Let's continue on our journey. 1760, George III becomes, King George III becomes king. Obviously, this begins the souring of British and colonial relationship. Ten years of tyranny begin in 1765. Many taxes levied against uh, the British colonists. The Boston Massacre occurs where five Americans were killed by British soldiers. Um, British soldiers began setting up camps within colonial homes. There was atrocities that were beginning to be committed. And the Boston Tea Party occurred in 1773 as kind of a culmination of these activities. But prior to that, 
Sam Adams, not the founder of a beer, but one of the uh, founding members of this leadership task force, had begin, begun an interact, uh, a beginning activity that rivals the modern day internet. It was called the uh, Committees of Correspondence. And the Committees of Correspondence goals were to circulate what the British were doing against the colonies, but also to speak to the rights of the colonists. And he wrote this, the rights of the colonists may best, best be understood by reaching and carefully, carefully studying the great lawgiver and the head of the church. Many people don't know this, but Sam Adams, as a result of starting these committees of correspondence, also created a motto for the Revolutionary War. Not many people know that there was a motto for the Revolutionary War, but the motto was, No King, but King Jesus. And so the call went out for the colonists not to declare a declaration of independence, but dependence on the Lord God Almighty for their protection. Well, the Boston Tea Party created a lot of anger within the British. They decided that Boston was a hotbed of, hotbed of patriotic activity, so they were going to put the squeeze on Boston, and they created a blockade where Boston was totally cut off. Interestingly enough, in that era, when you cut off a city by ship and by land, you have cut it off. You don't have FedEx next day service. You don't have Berlin airlift drop-ins. The city was cut off, and the people were beginning to starve. They wanted to press the city into submission. Interestingly enough, South Carolina responded with aid first. They sent 200 barrels of rice. North Carolina responded second with 2,000 pounds of North Carolina barbecue. I mean, <laughs> 2,000 pounds of British currency. George Washington himself pledged 50 pounds, which was $7,000 worth of today's currency. And so they began to get relief, but Boston was still under oppression when September 6, 1774, the First Continental Congress was called together. The first time that members from the, all of colonies came together to seek the Lord and say, what should we do as this gets more and more like a pressure cooker? Interestingly enough, they all felt compelled that the first activity they should undertake is not one of these throwaway prayers that you begin with a meeting frequently and say, oh dear God, bless this meeting and give us guidance. They prayed for three hours because they felt like Boston was being ransacked. They prayed fervently for America and for the Congress. Who can realize the emotion with which they turned imploringly to heaven for divine interposition? They had decided earlier that that day they would go ahead and use a scripture passage from the liturgical calendar. The Episcopal calendar slotted Psalm 35 for the selected reading that day. They didn't know what it was in advance, and as they opened the Bible that day, they found that Psalm 35 said this, Plead my cause, O Lord, with them that strive with me. Fight against, me that they, fight against them that fight against me. Take hold of the buckler and shield and rise up for my help. Draw also the spear and the battle axe to meet those who pursue me. Say to my soul, I am your salvation, and let those be ashamed and dishonored who seek my life. Let those be turned back and humiliated who devise evil against me. It seemed like a psalm for the day, and they took it as such. John Adams wrote this, and it's recorded in the Library of Congress, I never saw a greater effect upon an audience. It seemed as if heaven had ordained that psalm to be read on that morning, and it gave them spiritual courage. How many times has God spoken you through a passage of Scripture, a sermon here at Crossroads, a Wednesday night service, a radio pastor, something from a Bible devotional or the Bible itself on a particular day that's given you that kind of courage? Do you feed on that deed? Do you cherish that the God of the universe wants to encourage you in that way? They took it that way. April 19, 1775, the conflict's heating up even more. In fact, if you want to look at the beginning of the Revolutionary War, it really started here without the Declaration of Independence. There was a battle and a skirmish on Lexington Green where the Minutemen, a group of militia farmers, fired on a British brigade that was going to take some gunpowder from the colonials that were trying to defend themselves. They wanted to defend that gunpowder magazine, and so they fired on the British. It turned into a skirmish, and actually the farmers routed the British that day, but it upped the ante on this tension. Boston was still under siege at that point, and some of these militiamen began to gather, and they said, gosh, what can we do to get Boston free? And so they began to think about the British positions around Boston and say, God, how could we free Boston? 
And they realized they needed to set up a position where they could also have a military position around Boston and maybe they could wedge the British out if they were able to establish a more superior military position. Well, it turns out that a junior engineer named Rufus Putman had heard that George Washington was trying to think of ideas on how do you fortify a particular position in the dead of winter when you can't dig into the ground. George Putman, an engineer, had heard Washington's plea to solve this problem, and so he was walking by a general's tent one day, and as he walked by a general's tent, he decided he would walk in. He saw some library books that were on a shelf, picked up a library book on field engineering, opened it up, and lo and behold, on the pages where he opened, he found a type of defense that could be built out of boards and strapped together that did not have to be sunk into frozen ground. And he had never heard of this kind of defense mechanism before. It's built in advance like a wooden fence and then it can be taken to its position and assembled. They agreed that this was God's design for them to build the defense. Now they needed to fortify a particular position to make it happen. And so they picked Dorchester Heights as a place that they might establish a position on. The only problem is the British could see Dorchester Heights and they were not going to let this happen. Well, as it turns out, they said an evening that they would begin to work on this plan and a strange fog came in. It was a thick fog. It was a fog that allowed the 800 men to work and assemble these things in such a way that the sound was muffled and the British never knew what was happening. As they assembled these things throughout the night under the cover of fog, they began to work them up the hill, and the top of the hill was unshrouded with fog. It was bright enough, lit by a full moon, so that these fortifications could be put in place. But at the next morning, when the British woke up, in a miraculous way, this position had been fortified. Captain Charles Stewart said the fortifications appeared the next morning as if by magic, more than the work of human beings. A most astonishing night's work that must have employed 15 to 20,000 men, said Captain Robinson. And again, I, they only had 800. The rebels have done more in one night than my whole army could have done in months. Providence or accident? That junior military engineer walking into a library, picking a book. I don't know about you, but sometimes I call God my sovereign librarian. There's sometimes that there's books on my shelf that I've owned for years that I've never read, and suddenly, by the Holy Spirit, I'm inspired to pick one up and begin reading it, and it speaks to the exact situation I'm in. Has God ever met you as your sovereign librarian to speak specifically to your heart? Again, I've spoken of messages and other mechanisms, but through a book or through providential circumstances? July 4th, 1776, the day that we're celebrating, and in fact, I forgot to mention earlier, I'm attributing this particular message today to my grandmother, who would have been 99 today had she still been with us. With a firm reliance on protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. John Adams said this, Before God, I believe the hour has come. My judgment approves this measure, and my whole heart is in it. All that I have and all that I am and all that I hope for in this life, I am now ready here to stake upon it. And I leave off as I have begun that live or die, survive or perish, I am for the declaration. Have you ever come to a spot in your life that you felt that level of abandonment? They were facing the world's greatest superpower of the time with no army and no navy. Do the odds just seem incredibly stacked against you? Are you tired of working in your own human strength? Have you reached that level of abandonment? John Adams' words challenge me. The Liberty Bell was rung in Exodus, excuse me, Leviticus 25.10 is a scripture passage on that bell, and they chose it for that reason, because that scripture passage says, Proclaim liberty through all the land and tell all the inhabitants thereof. Again, a part of the biblical history of our country. Well, now these guys are marked men. The 56 signers are now traitors. The British wants to kill them. The war is on. August 28, 1776, the British could have crushed the revolution because they had George Washington and his 8,000-member army surrounded on Brooklyn Heights, New York. The East River of Manhattan that divided Brooklyn and Manhattan was hemming the colonials in on one side and the British army was up against them on the other. The Britons decided that they would wait till the next morning to attack. 
They were going to wipe out this revolution in its cradle of its gr uh, in the in its cradle, and yet Washington that night thought of a plan. Of those 8,000 men, the last number of men that had been assigned to his regiment actually happened to be excellent boat handlers. They got some boats, and the plan was to ferry all 8,000 men across a one-mile stretch of river back and forth throughout the night to escape this massacre. Well, this is a problem because it was stormy that day, so stormy that the British men of war ships could not get into the East River. But after night fell fell, the storm subsided and it got remarkably calm. So calm that they could maximize the load in each one of those boats so that the water could only be three or four inches from the gun walls of the boat and they could ferry the maximum number of men and munitions across. The ferrying began. It went through the night. Morning, the sun begins to come up. Not all the men are across. A massacre is imminent. Except for the fact that a strange fog began to rise from the ground. And for three hours, the strange fog covered the rest of the men as they made their escape. The fog lifted. The British went into the encampment. No one was there. They looked out on the river. The last boat was slightly out of firing range, and George Washington was on it. They fired a couple of volleys, but the revolution was on, and it was not crushed. Providence or accident? December 1777, now we're almost a year later, Valley Forge. It's called the Crucible of Freedom. Wars couldn't be won in six months' time in that era. It was a skirmish that lasted for over eight years, and Valley Forge was one stop. 11,000 men entered Valley Forge. 3,000 men died. One in four men died that winter. George Washington said this in February, I'm now convinced beyond a doubt that unless some great change suddenly takes place, this army will starve, dissolve, or disperse. But George Washington, man of prayer, didn't stop there. Quaker Isaac Potts was out for a walk one winter morning when he came upon a place that he heard a voice in the woods. He saw a horse tethered nearby and he began to approach the horse and then off in the distance he saw a figure kneeling in prayer from which this picture comes from. It was George Washington praying that day. <clears throat> Excuse me. He stood there quietly. General Washington finished, left the area. Potts went back to his wife and said this, If George Washington be not a man of God, I am greatly deceived. And still more shall I be, see, be deceived if God did not, through him, work out a great salvation for America. Providence or accident? Shortly after that, there was the arrival of Frederick Wilhelm Augustus Baron von Steuben. Now that's a name. I don't know where he stood in the elementary school line, but uh, you could probably supply any of those names you wanted and place yourself anywhere in the line you wanted. Did not speak English, only spoke German, but came as a recommendation from Benjamin Franklin to help George Washington and the troops learn how to drill. He spoke in German through a translator, and he'd get so frustrated sometimes he would go on a cursing tirade in German that was not translated, finish his tirade, and then begin the drill further. And so I have this picture in my mind's, my, mind's eye of a German just stomping around going, oh, oh, stop, oh, 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 and then going back to the drill. By the time he got done drilling these troops, they could fire a fresh volley every 15 seconds. And after that is when the French finally decided to weigh in in support of the war because they thought the colonies could win. It's interesting in the times of toughness how God does miraculous things. In Valley Forge that winter, God was forging the Continental Army from iron into steel. The Valley Forge men, as they were called, were frequently the ones throughout the rest of the war that led the challenges and the charges in all situations. And I have to ask myself today, are there any Valley Forge men and women in this congregation? Is God taking the troubles and the problems and the things that he's brought into your life to make you into Valley Forge men and women? James tells us that problems are into our life and we're, we're actually to invite them in as friends because they bring about the maturing and the development of us. Are you allowing yourself to become Valley Forge men and women? It's a challenge for me as well. June 1778, another crossroads time, came when the West Point was saved by the discovery of a plot against it. In an abbreviated fashion, I'll tell you this is where Benedict Arnold's name comes up in American history. He was the commandant of West Point. It sits on the Hudson River in New York, a strategic place that if it was lost, the Revolutionary War would be in a tough spot. 
as, uh, as we find out, um, Benedict Arnold was in a plot against the war. He had set up a relationship with British aid uh, to give the um, fortifications of the fort uh, and the details of how it was fortified to the British Army. That aid, as he was leaving the fort and going back to the British line, was captured by a uh, patrol troop of the American Brigade. George Washington said that day, treason of the blackest dye was yesterday discovered. The providential train of circumstances which led to it affords the most convincing proofs that the liberties of America are the object of divine protection. Providence or accident that one little aid out in the middle of a forest is caught by an American troop before he gave the plans that would kill the revolution. One last story that's close to my heart here in the North Carolina area. The battle had now moved south by the 1780s. Calpin's Battlefield, just south of Charlotte on I-85, is a place of, that began this particular story. Uh, one of George Washington's southern, arm, southern armies, led by General George Morgan, defeated an entire de detachment of Colonel um, Tarlington's troops at Calpin's Battlefield. General Cornwallis of the British Army was so infuriated, he took his whole army and began to chase George Washington's southern army until they came to the Catawba River, which runs down through Charlotte. When they got to the Catawba River, Washington's troops got on the other side. The British troops were about to cross when a thunderstorm and other storms produced such a flood that the British could not cross. They had to wait for several days. Several days later, the uh, British Army caught up to the uh, American troops at the Yatkin River, just near Salisbury. Just as they caught up to the American troops who were getting out to the other side, another storm occurred, flooded the river, and they were stopped again. Two weeks later, February 13th, they caught up to the American troops at the Dan River in northern Virginia, or northern North Carolina, near the Virginia border. Again, as the American troops were getting out on the other side, the river flooded and the British were stopped. A British captain said this, here the Royal Army was again stopped by a sudden rise of the waters which had only just fallen to let the enemy over again. Who could have escaped Cornwallis's grasp because he was so tightly upon their heels? Providence or accident? Just a few months later, the British su surrendered at Yorktown, Virginia. 6,000 British troops of Cornwallis's army was supposed to be shuttled off a point on the Chesapeake Bay, but storms stopped that and they were surrounded, and they were surrendered. The, Paris of, uh, the Treaty of Paris was signed two years after that, 1783, and the Revolutionary War came to a close. John Adams said this, I'm apt to believe that it will be celebrated July 4th by succeeding generations as the great anniversary festival. It ought to be commemorated as a day of deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to Almighty God. Those biblical principles of the Declaration can be founded in that handout that some of you have seen on your sheet called the Biblical Principles of the Declaration, but here they are before you. The laws of nature and of nature's God. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. A footnote here, they didn't interpret this as the pursuit of hedonism. For them, happiness was being responsible for what you did with your life, and they felt like a relationship with God was the starting point for happiness. We mistranslate and misunderstand that in this day and age. We therefore, the representatives of the United States of America and General Congress, appeal to the supreme judge of the world. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Being an American is not believing in your country right or wrong. It's in believing in living up to a set of ideals. A set of ideals that when they rang out in Russian prisons during Re President Reagan's era and prisoners he heard that Reagan told Gorbachev to tear down this wall, freedom rang in Russian prisons. In Tiananmen Square where students protested against communist rule, they held up a declaration of independence as an ideal. In Haiti, just this year, when turmoil came to the country, the American flag was waved, saying, come here, we need political freedom. Even Muslims in De De Detroit want to hear freedom ring in the Middle East. Some final reflections. I'm sure that there never was a people who had more reason to acknowledge a divine interposition in their affairs than those of the United States of America.
and I should be pained to believe that they have forgotten that agency which was so often manifested during our revolution, or that they failed to consider the omnipotence of that God who is alone able to protect them. A closing thought from Patrick Henry. Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, Almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. So the challenge as we've gone through this timeline today is to not only reflect on how amazingly and providentially God worked in our nation's affairs, but try and remember that as we magnify the Lord and see in our own lives in this day and age that we too can see God providentially at work. For some of you here today, it might be that God's providentially at work trying to bring you to Himself for the first time. I implore you to say yes to His work. It's a journey of freedom and spiritual vitality that you can't even imagine. For others, it's God providential working, saying, trust me in these circumstances. Trust me in your Valley Forge. Trust me for these things that concern you. This is Christian Civics Training. Thanks for listening.